Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so what are the challenges when I try to teach people like the things that I see as an electrophysiologist is it's very visual. So there's a lot of slides, but it goes by pretty quickly because a lot of it is pictures. Um, so I really try to avoid text as much as possible. And you know, I think a lot of EMS personnel, people in ERs, um, critical care doctors, um, you know, it's, it's either one extreme or another. Either people don't get rhythms, and they, but I don't think it's that they don't understand or they're not intelligent enough to understand. It just hasn't been taught well. So sometimes it's just, you know, if you don't have a good foundation, you can't build on that. And then I think a lot of EMS people like to look at rhythms because you guys see some funky stuff when you're out in the field. Um, and, you know, I think most people that go into, you know, first responding uh, fields, uh, they're used to adult rhythms, and pediatrics tends to throw people off. So I'll really do my best to try to explain things from the ground up and try to highlight the differences on kids versus adults. So the disclaimer is that all this is assuming the kid has a structurally normal heart. Uh, so part of being a pediatric cardiologist is also so we see kids with congenital heart disease, so we see kids with funky anatomy. And then as a result of their funky anatomy and any surgical operations, their ECGs are weird. So this is all assuming normal anatomy, okay? All right, so uh, I'm a pediatric cardiologist and electrophysiologist. Um, I came here in 2016 after I finished my electrophysiology fellowship at Texas Children's. Before that, I was at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, so uh, I came here when the joint heart program was started between Cincinnati Children's and Children's Hospital and Kentucky Children's Hospital when uh, the heart program basically got restarted from a surgical standpoint and an intervention standpoint. So I got hired to rebuild the arrhythmia program. So more than just interpreting rhythms and doing medical management, I do catheter ablations in children. I put in pacemakers, ICDs, um, and that includes children and some adults who have palliated congenital heart disease who were operated on as infants and they're 40 years old and the adult arrhythmia doctors have no idea which vein goes where. Um, so I, I've even done procedures on patients as old as 50. So uh, and as young as two weeks of age. And then part of that is also I deal with what are called channelopathies, which are inherited arrhythmia syndromes. And those are probably a rare minority of my practice. Um, you know, those patients usually have a clear genetic cause for their dangerous arrhythmias and you know, they cluster in families. Um, that probably makes up like 1% like of my practice. The majority of the time is actually normal kids with normal hearts. Um, and then they have an, a rhythm problem that they developed or something they were born with. Um, and then the other big chunk are the patients with structural heart disease. So the objectives of this talk, when I was kind of designing it for you guys, is to, I wanted to highlight one of the normal variants for pediatric ECGs and when to be suspicious um, and you know, call for help. And I think that's the important thing, knowing where the limits of your knowledge is. Um, you know, I think where people make mistakes are they don't wanna look incompetent in front of families um, or in front of their colleagues. Um, it takes a lot of maturity to know what you don't know, and I'm still learning every day. You know, I, with the partnership we have at Cincinnati Children's, I'm learning from the senior pediatric EP guys there who have been doing it much longer than I have. And there's something new I learn every day, uh, even like when we do conferences with them. Um, part of that is just obviously I'm a relatively young attending, only three years out of practice. So, you know, healthcare, medicine, it's a lifelong learning process. And I think I'd be scared for the day when I, when I don't stop learning something. Now, the other thing I also want to, I'm going to cover are arrhythmia emergencies in the field, um, acute stabilization and management, and I'm going to cover not really ACLS, but more PALS for young patients, and what are the limitations of the algorithms. All right, so micro P's and Q's. So everyone here knows, like, but your guys' background, you've all been taught, like, what basic rhythms are, you know, so everyone understands what a P, Q, or S, and T wave are. They understand what normal rhythms should be. Now, the challenge is that when you're out in, when you're out in practice, um, if you think about it, most of the patients who have abnormal rhythms are adults, and that makes sense. You know, it's usually the middle-aged adult, whether you're a man or a woman who has a two-pack per day history, has had two heart attacks, has type 2 diabetes, COPD, um, and you know, when you so as a rule of thumb, rhythm problems come from bad hemodynamics, bad cardiac function. So when you have a heart that doesn't function well with bad squeeze, bad diastolic dysfunction, then you get rhythm problems. So as a result, just by, if you look at all the rhythms out there, um, most of them are in adults. So obviously in kids, you know, it scares people when they don't, when they're seeing a child for the first time with a rhythm that's totally outside of their comfort zone. Um, but if you go back to basic principles and, you know, you, you can actually think through a problem very, very well. And the benefit, you know, it's a catch-22. The benefit of children is that because they're young and healthy and their hearts, are, they haven't suffered two or three heart attacks, they, you know, they don't have clogged up coronary arteries, they're not smoking two packs per day, it's amazing what they can tolerate. I've seen VT in a child um, at a rate of 300 for six hours, okay? 
you know, you obviously don't want that, that to keep going, but you know, if the child, if the child's mental status is fine and they're crying and they look okay, you have time. Okay, so you can think through things. You know, you don't have to jump to immediately putting an I.O. or intubating them. Um, but I, I would assume if you saw a child with a heart rate of 300, you'd be calling for help anyway. Okay, because obviously it's not a bread and butter type of thing. So everyone knows what the basics um, of cardiac rhythm are. So P, Q, R, S, and T waves. Your P wave represents depolarization of the atrium. Having a P wave does not mean it is sinus. There are abnormal SVTs that where you can still have P waves with every QRS. Um, sinus rhythm means it's coming from the sinus node. And to know that, you actually have to look at a full 12 lead ECG, okay? So just because you're looking at a single rhythm strip and if the rate is abnormal and clearly you have, you're dealing with a teenager who can verbalize to you on what's going on, you can't just assume it's sinus tack, okay? Um, and then your PR interval is the time from wherever electricity is starting in the atrium to get down to the AV node and that is normal. There's supposed to be a delay. And that was, if you, whether you believe in God or intelligent design, think about it. Your atrium have to contract empty blood into the ventricles, then the ventricles have to receive that blood relax before you actually activate them to get blood out of the heart. Okay? So that's normal physiology of the AV node and the conduction system. Then once it gets through the AV node and bundle of his, now the ventricles activate. The fact that the QRSs are nice and narrow, it, it kind of already tells you that you're dealing with a healthy conduction system. All right? And then the T wave is just repolarization of the ventricles. Your atria are repolarizing, it's just it's happening during the QRS, and the, you know, so you never really see it, like on a, on a rhythm strip or an ECG. So everyone, I think you guys are told from the beginning, kids are not small adults. So you know, normal heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now in children, it varies depending on the age. And, you know, and this is, you know, if you don't have a lot of experience with children, you guys have reference cards with you, you've all gone through PALS, it's okay to look it up. Um, or if you have a senior person with you who obviously has more gray hairs and is, this is not their first rodeo, you ask. Okay? So from birth to one year, 90 to 170 beats per minute, and it makes sense. As you get older, you know, your peak heart rate can drop. You know, I don't really apply the adult age criteria until 16 years of age. So for the amount of time, and when you're out in the field, when you're away from standalone children's hospitals, keep in mind, most 12 lead ECG machines are calibrated towards adults. It's gonna read anything with a, a rate above 100 as sinus tack, obviously if it looks like P, Q, or S, and T. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is sinus tack, uh, but you also don't wanna lower yourself into a false sense of security. And sometimes you have to put things in context. If you're looking at a 16-year-old who obviously run, does cross country and is running 20 miles per week, why would he be sitting there with a heart rate of 120, okay? Story from fellowship, I had a, a track runner who was all state in, in Pennsylvania and you know she was running for like years and she was at, fixed at a heart rate of 110 and for whatever reason someone got an ECG she was in VT like a slow VT and then when I looked back at the PCP notes when she finally came to us um, the PCP was documenting heart rates of 100 110 for two years okay All right, so pediatric rhythms, other than rate, you have to keep in mind other things too. If they have more vagal tone, um, they're more sensitive to the autonomic influences of their nervous system. So we see a lot of sinus arrhythmia. You know, I like to call sinus arrhythmia the accordion rhythm. Kind of like if you look from 100 feet away, you look at their rhythm strip, you see it undulating. Okay? That's just from normal breathing. When you take a deep breath, you have more parasympathetic tone, your heart rate slows down. You breathe out, your heart rate speeds up because you have that parasympathetic withdrawal and then you have more of a sympathetic drive. You lose that variability as you get older. Um, you know, I, I don't think I, you know, for all the adult congenitals I've seen, they don't really have that variability like well into, like they lose that once they get to their 30s and 40s. Um, and then, you know, your physiology and pathophysiology changes from birth all into your, in, in the first year of life. So when you're born, I mean, if you think about the blood flow of a fetus before the baby's even born, blood comes from the placenta, gets into the right atrium, goes down the RV, goes out the PA, then it goes into the duct to come back to the left side, and then it goes out the aorta or it gets into the right atrium and goes across a PFO, which everyone has as a fetus. That's, that's supposed to be there. So the whole idea is your lungs aren't functioning. You know, you're, the baby's swimming in amniotic fluid, and the idea is to get oxygenated blood to the organs that need it the most, the brain. So if you think about it, for nine months when that heart is developing, the right ventricle is the workhorse. That's what's pumping out to the body. So actually when you're born, your RV is thicker than your left ventricle. So it's not uncommon. ECGs of babies, you see right axis deviation. You see right ventricular hypertrophy. You, know, you put it in context. And then those changes resolve pretty quickly in the first four months of life. Okay? 
So typical ECG findings, now we're going to focus on young athletes, which I think is probably the bulk of what you guys will end up seeing. You know, not uncommon when you get a teenager who, you know, like Dr. Cooper described, was out partying, passed out, um, or they, you know, maybe they were, up, they were a good kid and studying until 3 in the morning, and then they passed out, you know, and they got up too quickly and their head hit the toilet when they got up to use the bathroom. Um, and then, you know, EMS is called. So in general, um, so here clearly, so you guys all know how the most 12 lead ECGs are organized. On the first left half are usually your limb leads, one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. And on the right side are your precordial leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. V1 and V2, you know, this is usually over the right ventricle, and on the left, left side, on the right side, sorry, on the right side of the ECG paper are the left side of leads, which are more over the left ventricle. So remember, all this is on the assumption that they should have the normal lines. Okay? So, in general, um, if the ECG is done correctly, um, then you don't have to, then it makes it easy to interpret. Um, so, you know, for every, so sinus rhythm doesn't mean that you just have to pee with every QRS complex. It means it's coming from the sinus nerve. So vector cardiography is, very simply, if electricity is going towards a lead, you get a positive deflection above the baseline. If it's away from the lead, you get a negative deflection. So where's your sinus node located? Right or left atrium? Right. Yeah, your right atrium. So the leads that represent the right side of the body are AVR, uh, and then towards your foot is AVF. Lead one is all the way out, pointing towards your left arm, also where V5 and V6 are. So if your sinus node is depolarizing, and that's what's driving the rhythm of the heart, it's going away from the right side, you know, down towards the lower septal right atrium, towards your AV node, then it goes down through your hypohemia system. And because most, most people with a structural normal heart, your LV is bigger than your RV, it's going towards your left side, and your heart's obviously more positioned in your left chest. So ideally, your P wave should be negative in AVR if it's coming from the sinus node, positive in one, two, and AVF. And then this is usually what a sinus node behaves like. I mean, you know, if you look really closely, I mean, it's hard when you're far, far away. You know, sinus arrhythmia, you can kind of mimic with the patient's breathing. So here, where the R to R's are getting closer, it's a faster heart rate. And then as, he's, as the patient's breathing, you see it gets slower. So, you know, it's behaving like a typical sinus node, all right? So abnormal rhythms are usually can have a more variability or they'll be completely regular. Okay? So it looks like it's a it looks like it's a sinus P wave, it's coming from the right location, and every P is, a, is associated with every QRS. So you can kind of follow through physiologically what's happening. Sinus node is depolarizing, getting through the atrium. When it gets through the atrium, that's when your that's when the entire atrium contracts. So that's what the P wave represents. Then as it gets getting through the hypogeal system, so by the time kids have hit their teenage years, you know, the QRSs should look like that of an adult almost. You know, so that means normal QRS progression. So think about it, your right side of leads, your LV is the dominant mass. So you've got an S wave, usually more predominant S wave than V1, because it's electricity is going away. So remember, your AV node is in the right atrium, so you're going from right down the middle down towards the left. And then the R waves become more predominant as you go across the decorder leads. Okay? So you get a normal QRS progression as you go from uh, the right side of the core leads to the left. Now, in teenage athletes, you see a lot of this. You see a lot of ST elevation. Now, ST elevation, in, for most people who are relatively new in healthcare, it makes them worry about heart attacks. How often have you guys seen, like, this is a sincere question to you guys, how often have you actually seen a teenager present with acute STEMI? Right. And that's the first thing that every parent is worried about. You know, and I usually have to talk them down off a ledge in clinic or in the ER. You know, most causes of chest pain are usually not, you know, you know, it's unusual. You have to live for 30 years to build up enough cholesterol burden for it to clog your coronary arteries. Okay? Now, there are rare genetic hyperlipidemias out there that you know, sometimes we see, but those are usually going to be near centers like Cincinnati Children's where they have a genetic problem in the way they metabolize their lipids with cholesterol levels in the thousands. Now, that I've seen rarely, like once in like five years. And those kids could actually have a heart attack in their teenage years. But for the most part, unless you've got a severe, significant lipid metabolism problem, we don't see MIs in our population. Unless you're smoking, you're just snorting a powdery white substance. Okay? So usually, the, what, so what usually what often we see when we see ST elevations, it's, it's something called early repolarization. That basically means if you get healthy myocardium and you depolarize really quickly, you repolarize really quickly. Okay? You know, so what, when, you're QR, when you're looking at your PQRS and T waves, what the ECG is actually showing you is a summation of all the electrical forces in every cell of the heart. So because healthy children have healthy conduction systems, they quickly depolarize their hypotension system, and you repolarize really quickly. That's why you have that ST uh, elevation above the baseline. And it's usually a particular shape. It's concave in shape, 
Okay? It's not horizontal plateauing or depressed. Okay? And there are criteria like what's considered pathologic ST changes. And you know, that's not something I expect uh, primary responders to be aware of. But you know, when the ER, when they bring it to the ER and the ER doctor's chatting with me, of course I'll take a look at it, you know, and I'll review it. Um, but this is not something I'll call pathologic ST changes. And you know, and if the ST changes are pathologic and worried about a STEMI, they should follow a coronary distribution. Okay? So that's when the adult uh, cardiologists are, are looking at a 1280 CG and they're localizing leads to areas of coronary anatomy. This doesn't really follow coronary distribution anymore. You know, it's, it's all down with the cordial leads. You know, if it was all only in like V5, V6, one in AVL, you'd be worried about the, LA, the LAD or the CERC, um, inferior right coronary arteries, the inferior leads. So in general, ST elevation that is benign is usually at this concave shape, and in the precordial leads in children, you're allowed to have it up to two millimeters above. Okay? Above that is considered abnormal. And in the, in the limb leads, it should be no more than one millimeter, so one tiny box above the baseline. And your baseline is basically the your PR elevates. So you kind of draw a line across and you see how much it elevates above. So it's the shape and the magnitude, okay? All right, another common finding here. So if you look around here, these are pretty big forces. The QRSs look pretty big. So the other thing with young teenage uh, teenagers, and you can even see this in college age students if they're really well conditioned athletes, like elite runners, you know, soccer players, a lot of aerobic conditioning. When you're doing a lot of aerobic activity, you develop what's called eccentric hypertrophy. Your heart dilates just because of all the stroke volume. Like if they're running like 30 miles per week, you know, so Lance Armstrong had a resting heart rate in the 30s. Now, if you take away the blood doping, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was, think about it. When you're a really well-conditioned athlete, you don't have to have a heart rate of 70 and rest. You know, with a heart rate of 40, like every heartbeat is a ton of stroke volume. That's just how well-conditioned they are. Okay? So sometimes we see what's called physiologic left ventricular hypertrophy. It doesn't necessarily mean they're cardiomyopathy, but that falls on us. All right. So I think for a young person, definitely in college age or below the age of 18, if there's any concerns, call us. So a lot of literature came out actually this past year. Um, which I'll, yeah. So here, this is physiologic elevation from training, but there's no T wave inversions, there's no Q waves. You know, the QRS looks nice, narrow, and healthy, progressing. It's obviously a sinus rhythm, looking at the P wave axis. Okay. This is another common variant that sometimes we see in athletes that people freak out about. When the QRS uh, in V1 looks a little abnormal, people always say RSR prime, they worry about the bunny ears. The bunny ears is actually a normal finding in children. You know, remember, a bundle branch block is not just a bunny ear shape, it has to be a wide QRS. So in adults, the upper limit for a QRS duration is 120 milliseconds, which is three tiny boxes. I see this like at 90 milliseconds or like 100 milliseconds in teenagers. And a real right bundle branch block it means that you're having the right bundle. So when you have a right bundle branch block, it means that the right side of the conduction system below the bundle of this, it just doesn't conduct as fast as the left side. So as a result, you get a broad R way, and usually that a broad R prime way. So that means the second peak is like almost twice the height of the first R wave. Okay? So an RSR prime doesn't necessarily mean a right bundle branch block. All right? Now the thing that people worry about also is something called Brugada disease. Brugada disease is a channelopathy. It's a mutation in the sodium channel in the heart. Um, where there's a family history of people dying early. Okay, and they die from ventricular arrhythmias. So usually the Brigada pattern, it can look like an RSR prime, but it, 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 you have what's called a co-shaped ST segment. Okay, it goes right into the T wave. Here, look, RSR prime, and it comes right down flat, and then you have a T wave. So this is not a Brigada, that's a Brigada pattern. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, make sense? All right. And sometimes this is also very dependent upon the quality of the ECG. A lot of times when people are, uh, don't have, even, I've seen this even in 19-year-old um, college students, and you think in an adult ER, they know how to do an ECG. If you place the leads just even one rib space by accident, you can create that pattern. So sometimes just the ECG being done wrong leads to a misdiagnosis. Okay? Oh, that was not it. Okay. So this is the newest literature that came out recently this past year. So um, there are ECG adaptations to being an athlete. And I think right now the US is behind where the rest of the world is. And the problem is, is that the US population, we have a very diverse ethnic population. African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, Caucasians. In, in populations like Europe, France, you have a much more ethnic homogenous population. So for them, they have more ECG screening for their pediatric patients. What we've learned is that there are actual differences in ethnicities. So African Americans of West African Cuban descent actually have a lot more LVH that's physiologic. You know, we would be doing tons more echoes on teenagers if we, you know, with the way things are right now. So this is an evolving trend right now. Just kind of be aware that there are going to be findings that are going to change 
like how we look at ECGs and what we do in the outpatient setting. Now, if this doesn't affect you guys, obviously, in the first responder situation, but just be aware of that, that it's going to be a changing paradigm in the upcoming years. All right, so now other normal variants. Sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia in athletes can be a very normal finding. Now, if you clearly, if you're chatting with, if you're looking at a teenager and it looks like that their BMI is like less than 20, I'd be worried about them having anorexia. And that's someone that definitely probably needs to be evaluated in the ER, and make sure that they don't have severe electrolyte abnormalities from vomiting, and they, they probably need to be admitted and observed and managed acutely. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if you're looking at a you know, cross country runner who clearly lo looks like they're healthy, you know, they have good vagal tone, um, you know, a heart rate of 45, if it's sinus and it looks like sinus arrhythmia, there's nothing to do about it. Okay? Incomplete right bundle brain fluff, like I mentioned, if you have the RSR prime pattern but the QRS is not wide, you need to cut off for a prolonged QRS, it's not abnormal, usually no further workup is warranted. You'd be surprised how often I get that consult in clinic from general pediatricians. Now, anterior T wave inversions in children can be normal. Okay, so it's actually okay for kids to have T wave inversions V1 through V3 in isolation of itself. If the QRS looks fine and it's a sinus rhythm, it takes, and that has to do with early repolarization, it takes a while, like into your third decade of life, for the T wave to flip upright. Okay? You have to put it in the context of other findings. So it's never just like one single finding of itself that usually mandates emergent evaluation. Okay? Sorry. All right, Ex ectopic atrial or junctional rhythms at a normal rate for their age is actually also a normal finding. Sometimes if they have high, va high vagal tone, your sinus node just isn't very active, you'll have escape rhythms. They'll have a lower atrial escape where the P wave doesn't look like it's coming from the sinus node, but if it's at a rate of 70 and the kid's 16, nothing to do. All right? I've even seen junctional rhythm in athletes. And then if you put, I put a 24-hour halt on them, I can see they clearly have a sinus node when they're active, like it wakes up when you get them to run. Or if you have them hooked up to a monitor, you know, obviously if they are, unless they're, you think they're unstable, don't do this. You can just have them jump up and down, and then you see the P wave coming. Okay? First degree AV block is also considered a normal variant. Like, you know, so the upper limit of a PR normal for an adult is 200 milliseconds. In a teenager, it's 160. So remember, if you're looking at an ECG that was done in an adult ER and doesn't have the pediatric software and, and interprets it according to adult standards. It's going to call every, every teenager with first degree of the block. Doesn't mean it is. Okay? But even then, if I had a cr healthy cross-country runner with a PR interval of 210, nothing to do. Okay? So everything I'm saying is predicated on assuming those symptoms. So symptoms are what drive the management of patients, um, you know, if you're worried about an ECG abnormality. Um, so it, it really comes down to history um, in, in, in context with the ECG. And I see Mobitz, Mobitz 1 all the time in athletes when they're asleep. You know, but for all the, teen, the teenagers I do halters on, I see it always between 1 and 3 a.m. I'm not putting pacemakers in teenagers for that alone. Okay? So that's just from high vagal tone. There are borderline findings and abnormal ECG findings um, in this new consensus statement. Um, so but I'm, I, I don't want to focus on this um, because this is a changing paradigm. So I think until things formally change at the national level, we're kind of currently managing things as status quo. Okay? Just be aware that it's, it's a changing field right now. All right, so now we're going to go through some cases that I think that are very uh, much up your guys' wheelhouse. So first case is a three-week-old ex full term infant who came to UK. This was month one for me as an attending here at UK. It was like, welcome to attending hood. I was on service, I get to my office thinking I was done, I had signed out for the day to the on-call person, and, I, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to read all my ECGs in my inbox, like in our electronic system. I pull them up and I see an ECG, I'm like, oh, nuts. <laughs> and I look at the time, I'm like, hey, the ECG was done in the last 15 minutes. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna pass it off to my colleague, I was there, so I went and dealt with it. So this is a kid that was in the ER, three days of poor feeding, fussiness, and emesis. In the last 24 hours, he was not able to eat, and he's had decreased urine output, he was seen by the PCP four days prior for a well child visit. No sick contacts, fevers. He had maybe like one cough, one episode of sweating while asleep. And this is, these are vital signs. All right, so go ahead and just tell me what's abnormal about them. Yeah, the heart rate's abnormal. That can still be sinus tack of the fur baby. Okay? What else is abnormal? That temp is low. Okay, that's a little concerning for a four week old. Um, and respirations. That actually is normal for a baby. So definitely reacquaint yourself with our normal vital signs. Um, you know, now my, be that as it may, we've all seen the infant with a, with a respiratory rate of 40 and then they're about to be intubated. 
You never know where they are in their process. So they, for all you know, six hours prior, they could have been breathing at a rate of 80 to 90. And now the respiratory muscles are getting tired, and now it's in the normal range. Okay? So vital signs are vital, but you also have to look at the patient. Okay? Patient got a 40 cc per kilo fluid bolus because he appeared mottled, and then he got hemp and gent after they started getting blood cultures and urine cultures. The chest X-ray showed no consolidation. The heart looked normal, and they showed a bedside ultrasound that showed good squeeze. He was getting agitated, and they were prepping for an LP, and then this happened. That was the ECG that I saw. <clears throat> okay, diagnosis. Huh? It's a ticked off kid. It's more than just ticked off. So, what's the rate on this? So, just take two of the QRSs. Yeah, it's almost 300 beats per minute. Okay. So, my advice to people, like if they're unfamiliar with rhythms in general, and you can apply this to adults and kids, avoid telling a diagnosis unless it's blatantly obvious. You know, V fib should be fairly obvious. Okay. A systole should be obvious. The mistake that people make is they try to jump to a diagnosis because they try to recognize patterns. Now, a lot of what I do, there comes a point where it does become pattern recognition, but you have to go to basic principles first, learn the physiology, learn what the different manifestations are of the common rhythms, and then you get to a point where now you can kind of look at it from across the room and make the diagnosis. When you're early in your training and experience, avoid doing that until you get to that level where you feel like you're at a proficient level. So the best thing is just describe what you see. So yes, it's fast. Now, what is it regular or irregular? Regular. Regular. Okay, now QRS, narrow or wide? Narrow. narrow. Okay, so now you can go from there because now you have the information. If you're dealing with someone in the field and you're communicating with medical command for a physician, they have a differential in their head. Okay? So this is unlikely to be VT just by the fact that it's regular and, na and a narrow QRS. Okay? All right. So SVT, now to an arrhythmia doctor, both adults and kids, it's like a wastebasket term because there's different types of SVTs. Not everything in pediatrics that's a narrow QRS complex and regular is SVT. Now, we assume that when people are communicating with us, um, you know, when ERs are calling us and first responders are calling us, that they're talking about what's called paroxysmal SVT. So the typical pattern of SVT is heart rate is fine, and then boom, you're off to the races. You know? So like for most children, their heart rates are like you know, 90 to 150, like especially the babies. And if you're a teenager, it's going to be you know, um, four, you know, 50 to it's like 110. They're fine, they're fine, they're fine, and SVT is boom, off to the races, okay? And then break, come down. As opposed to like if you put them on a treadmill and you're running them, sinus tachycardia is gradual, right? Your catecholamines have to get up, your sinus node now is beating faster and faster and faster. So there's a pattern like to how most arrhythmias start and initiate. So when we, people talk about SVT, I assume most people are talking about one of these two. So the type that's paroxysmal, where you have abrupt onset, abrupt termination, and you're fixed at a, at a fixed rate, is usually going to be what's called pathway-mediated SVT or AV node reentry, where basically you have an anatomic circuit, and you're, when you're caught in the circuit, that's why you're fixed. Okay. Now there are other types of SVT. SVT just means so we know what it stands for: supraventricular tachycardia. The PALS algorithm was designed really to deal with this, which covers 90% of the SVTs out there in children. It's not designed for this. Okay, and this is where I've seen people get in trouble. Okay? Because what happens is they think, oh my god, adenosine's not working, it's not working. Now they shock, they made it worse. When they try to when you try to fit a round peg into a square hole, that's when you get into trouble. Okay? So it's fine. The algorithms are good for are designed for first responders, ER doctors, and people seeing a patient on the front lines. But now, if something doesn't fit, or you do something that makes the patient worse, stop what you're doing and rethink, what, rethink what's going on. Either you have the diagnosis wrong, or you, gave, or you did something wrong. Make sense? OK. So most SVTs come, come into two categories. Those that respond to adenosine, that means they're dependent on the AV node, or those that don't respond to adenosine. Okay? So adenosine works by acting on the AV node. It inhibits conduction, it blocks the very transient. What's the half-life of adenosine? Seconds. Seconds, right. So what, ha what happens is that it's in by your red blood cells right away. So if you have to give adenosine to a patient, what are the logistical things that you're gonna do? Well, where's the IV have to, where's the IV go? As close to the heart as possible, okay? Now you can do it through a, through a foot IV, you're just gonna have to give a very, you either have to be a very big gauge with a very good saline bush. Okay? And sometimes your IV you have is what you have. I mean, I, I, I've even pushed it through a scalp IV. You've got to be careful, obviously, with a more delicate IV, you can blow it. Okay? But ideally, you want it as close uh, to the heart as possible. Okay? 
You want a very good sailing push, and then sometimes you have to do it together with a partner, like someone like turning the stopcock to push the sailing while one person's pushing the adenosine, and do it together and communicate. Okay. So basically, with paroxysmal SVT, in children, this is more common. When they, they're born with an extra electrical pathway, and usually these are just muscular fibers, like when the heart develops. You know, your valve ring, think of it as rubber tubing on a wire. The way the heart develops is you start off with one heart tube, the heart starts to fold, the common AV valve now has to septate and form your tricuspid and mitral valve. The conduction system goes right down the middle. The, the valves of the heart are like rubber tubing in a wire. Electricity is not supposed to go through them, okay? Nature's not perfect. Sometimes a muscular fiber actually crosses that valve ring, and now you have a way to connect to the normal conduction system, and now you've physically created a circuit, okay? The other type of circuit, and this is what the adults see more often, um, but I see this in teenagers, okay? AV node reentry is where the, it's a micro circuit around the AV node. You have a slow input and a fast input. In terms of management, you do the same thing, okay? Because the AV node is, the, is basically part of it. So if you block one part of the circuit, you, you get them out of it, okay? Now, it's not a guarantee they're not going to go back into it. Now, other SVTs, such as atrial flutter, are reentry circuits only in the atrium. They don't care what the AV node is, is involved. Or you have a focal atrial tap, like you have an abnormal cell that's driving the rhythm that's totally independent of the sinus node. Okay? And AFib is chaotic atrial activity, where your atrium just cannot have coordinated electrical activity. Okay? So those are all, technically AFib is the most common SVT in the world. Okay, if you just think about it, adults and kids. All right? Never make a diagnosis of a, of a rhythm based on rate. It gets a lot of people into trouble. You can say it's likely, but you really need the rhythm strip and the ECG to make the diagnosis. So as a rule of thumb, usually most rates, less than 220, will be sinus tact in pediatric patients. That includes teenagers and babies, okay? I've seen SVT in a teenager as fast as 270, okay? I've also seen SVT in a teenager at a rate of 110, okay? I bladed someone three weeks ago, their SVT was between 90 to 110 beats per minute, and it's just a very slow AV node reentry circuit. Okay? So never make the diagnosis. So obviously, if it's 250 and above, it's always abnormal. Okay? This is the gray area where people get into trouble. So if you think about common things that are common, you know, a child with a fever and septic could be sinus tachyoid rate at 230. All right, but you know, hopefully the ER is working that up. They're getting a 12 lead, making sure that it really isn't SVT. So we will get back to our case and I'll tell you how that played out. So the per, some of the basics for ECG, remember, the assumptions are the ECG is standardized, 10 millimeters per millivolt, that's how you interpret voltage and LVH, and the paper speed is 25 millimeters per millisecond. And time is in, the, in this axis, all right? So we all know like what the boxes should mean. So the way, because the paper speed being counted, so the ECG really wasn't standardized until the 1950s with the American Heart Association. Uh, but then after that, you know, it pretty much became standard across the board, like how ECGs are done, what the paper actually, mean, what the lines mean to help you figure out the rate, okay? One big box, which is where the thick red lines are, is 200 milliseconds. And then five little boxes make up one big red box. So five little boxes, so each little box is 40 milliseconds. 40 times five, 200, okay? The Dubin method that people always seem to hang their hat on works if it's a regular rhythm. If it's an irregular rhythm, remember, depending on where you're calibrating your QRS is, you can make it the arrhythmia 150 beats or you can make it 250 beats per minute, okay? Especially if it's irregular. So just keep that in mind, all right? So for our baby, here, I could use the Dubin method because it's fairly regular. Here, actually, look, it's broken and it restarted. Okay? So the Dubin method here is fine. You know, like I heard someone saying 300 beats per minute because you probably saw that the QRS is land on the two thick red lines. All right? Okay. All right. So my advice is just get in the habit of describing what rhythms look like rather than giving a diagnosis, especially if you're early and you are a novice at rhythms because then you can't go wrong. Okay? So, how would you describe, let's assume that these are nice narrow QRSs. How would you describe this? Regular. How would you describe this? Now, Regularly irregular. Yes, and then this? Irregular. Okay, right, so if you, irregularly irregular usually is AFib because there's no atrial activity. Atrial foci are firing at multiple points, sometimes as high as 400 beats per minute, so then the QRSs are like all over the place, okay? All right, so the simplified approach Regular, irregular, and then you have to remember for pediatrics, the QRS will vary depending on age, what is considered normal and abnormal. The adults have the luxury of saying greater than three boxes is wide. 
Now, in children, you have to be careful. And I'll show you an example where um, it was misdiagnosed. So in adults, like I said, less than 120, which is three tiny boxes, is considered narrow. What greater than that is wide. In children, 80 milliseconds, you know, so 85 is technically the upper limit of normal. I realistically just use 82 boxes. It's just easier. Okay? And then usually 90 to 100 around the school age years. And then I really don't apply the 120 until they're teenagers. Okay? All right. The palace card. So now going back to our patient. So this patient is now, well, we'll do that right now. So if you look at the tachycardia algorithm, right, you, obviously you maintain the patient airway, they, you have a monitor on, you get access, you get a 12 bit ECG um, available. The big break point is narrow versus wide. Okay, so now if we go down the narrow algorithm, which is this kid, now we have, now you evaluate. Where do you think this kid should go? 280 beats per minute. 280 to 300 beats per minute. Is this, do you think it's sinus tach or SVT? It's like an SVT. Okay, there's no way your sinus, no physiologically can get to a rate of 220. 280, sorry. Okay? So now stable versus unstable, anyone know what this is from? Yeah, what, what was the uh, name of this episode? Eye the Beholder. Okay, so this lady who was on this alien planet thought that she was ugly. You know, and tried to have the surgery to fix her face, but it turns out this is what everyone else looked like. Okay? So stable versus unstable is in the eye of the beholder. The challenge with fast rhythms in children is that when we get your blood pressures, think about the oscillator, you know, if you're using a Dynamap or something automatic and it's trying to measure the blood pressure on a kid in a heart rate of 280, it's not accurate. Okay? Because it's relying on being able to feel that pulse and hear that pulse. Like, you know, if it's basically like a jackhammer in your chest, you can't tell like when systole or diastole is. Okay, so then you may get an artificially low blood pressure. The most important thing really is looking at their mental status and their, and their perfusion, like how do they look, okay? I've never seen a, so it makes sense. You know, your blood pressure is gonna look like crap when you're having a heart rate of 280, okay? But because kids are young and their myocardium is healthy, you caught them early in their process, they have only been in it for maybe like an hour, they're gonna look okay. So you gotta go with that, and that'll help you decide stable versus unstable. I've seen kids get shocked unnecessarily when they're talking and mentating, like five-year-olds. Okay? But this is where I have to remind myself as the arrhythmia doctor, I have the benefit of my training. You know, I, I've seen the unstable SVTs, I've seen the ones that appear stable but are unstable. So, you know, we always trust you guys out in the field. You're the ones looking at the patient. Okay? So I'll, I'll never Monday morning quarterback in that case. Look, as you can justify it. All right, so tr options for the treatment of SVT. Vagal maneuvers are age dependent. Um, we don't do coronal eyeball pressure. That's just not standard of care. You're gonna give the kid a coronal abrasion, okay? Um, you can do ice to the face. Ideally, what you do is you take ice, put it in the Ziploc bag, add a little bit of water, and then you put it over the bridge of their nose. Um, and basically, it's a diving reflex. It stimulates the glossopharyngeal and the vagus, vagus nerve to put a parasympathetic impulse to try basically do what adenosine does. It slows conduction of the AV node and tries to block and break the circuit, okay? Um, so you can, if they're old enough and they can cooperate, you know, most five-year-olds will understand. And if you stick a straw in their mouth, tell them blow really hard. You know, that's basically, you know, if you tell a five-year-old to poop, they're just gonna giggle at you. Okay, I mean, how I giggle now at the age of 36. Okay, um, teenagers can do a handstand. Um, I, that's something I would advise in the outpatient setting if they have, once you've made the diagnosis of SVT, they're trying to decide if they want an ablation or not, um, only if they're coordinated and obviously they can do it. <laughs> All right, would not be advising that to a 10-year-old. The modified valve saw is something that came out recently in the last couple of years where, you know, you can, they, they bear down and then you lay them supine and you raise their legs, okay? It improves the effect, efficacy of, a, uh, of, a, of trying to break SVT. And then there are medications. So adenosine is great because it's so short acting and it does two things. It's more than just getting them out of SVT, it's great at making a diagnosis. Because if you go back to kind of that picture I showed you about different types of SVTs, it helps me figure out mechanisms. So that's, so ideally what I want, um, or any pediatric cardiologist, when you're consulting, when we're getting involved for a child with a new diagnosis of SVT, you want to run a rhythm strip and give the adenosine and mark when you're giving it. Because it will show me what happens, like when you give the adenosine, does it slow down, uh, does it slow down and then you see multiple P waves, so it might just be a focal atrial tack, or does it abruptly break and you get a pause, that tells you that it's adenosine sensitive. Because now management, I know what to put this kid on uh, as an outpatient. And so the, I think the challenges you guys have are obviously when you come into the ER, the ER doctors are going to start, you know, running points and, you know, but if you have the documented SVT strip, because sometimes kids come to the ER and they break on their own, 
And then, you know, if I see them in the outpatient setting, you know, they, and I don't have the SVT documented, I'm not going to recommend a catheter ablation if they're a safe agent size. As a rule of thumb, I don't take kids to the ET lab for ablations unless I see a documented abnormal rhythm. Can you imagine how many kids I would take and put catheters in their heart if they came to me just for palpitations? Okay, so ideally we want to see it documented before we do something invasive. Okay, so it's helpful, to, uh, like from you guys, if you actually have it documented, you have it on a rhythm strip, and let's say they convert by the time they get to the ER, they can't get a 12 lead, make a Xerox copy, give it to the, give it to the ER doctor so it's part of their chart. Because that helps them in the long term. And then DC cardioversion is always a, an option, okay? All right, so the starting dose for adenosine in a child is 0.1 milligrams per kilo. You can give up to 0.2 per kilo or a max of 0.3. I've given higher doses, um, but that's only, that, that's on me. But for you guys, you have to go by what PALS recommends. It's an extremely short half-life because your red cells eat it right away, hence the logistics. You want to get it in an IV as close to the heart as possible. And then this is the typical dose what you would get for a newborn. So it's a very small syringe, the indecimals. Okay? And this is what you want. This is what I want to see like for a child that presents for the first time in SVT because it gives a diet. This is that same kid, by the way. This is the Xerox copy. So like when I went to the ER and the kid was in an SVT, they were worried the kid was septic and he went into it right in front of us like, no, this is SVT. I basically had to take the adenosine and have the ER doctor's hat hand and do it myself because people were fixating on sepsis. So we, here's the kid in SVT. We give the adenosine and it abruptly breaks and then it actually reveals the answer. P, Y, Q, R, S, delta wave, he did that with PW. So now I know why he's having an SPT. He, he has an accessory pathway, okay? And then pre-excited, pre-excited, and then his QRS is back to normal, okay? So here's the other take-home message. Most kids with WPW, they may not always have it on their 12 weight because what you're seeing on the ECG is basically what is the more predominant electrical conduction through the heart. The challenge with young kids, they got healthy AV nodes, and if it conducts the same or faster than your accessory pathway, your ECG is going to look normal. So remember, they're competing with each other. You have that extra electrical connection, and then you have the normal his Purkinje system. Now, so the kid came out, but now he went back into it. Now what? Kid stable. Hmm? Well, he went back into SVT. Yeah, yeah, you're monitoring the patient the entire time. He's on a monitor. So now what do you do? <coughs> so. <laughs> insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Why would a medicine that lasts seven seconds keep him out? So this is what the physiology is for re-entry SVT. There's three reasons why kids go in and out of SVT. You have to have the actual anatomic circuit, whether it's an extra accessory pathway, or you have two inputs into your AV node for this type. So adenosine proves the mechanism that the AV node is involved. Okay? So now what's the next step on the PALS algorithm? Expert consultation. Okay? Think about it this way. This is where I, I sometimes, this is what, where the light bulb comes on for most people when I explain this to you. Imagine an asthmatic coming into the ER. You're giving them two hours of continuous albuterol, and they're still going, having said as asthmaticus. Is the answer more albuterol? Yeah. No, you're going to do something different. Same thing with SVT. Okay? They have something abnormal electrically in their heart, and they keep going back into it. So you need to have the anatomic circuit, you need the trigger, and then it's the adrenaline state. Okay? So think about it. Most SVT reentry circuits, you have, you have the actual fireplace and the kindling, and what often puts them into it is this. So look, normal rhythm, and then boom, off to the races. It's usually a PAC that puts you into it, or a PDC. Okay? It gets into the circuit, and now you're off to the races. Okay? So now you can do something different. Adenosine is not going to keep them out. Okay? So now we need antiarrhythmic. All right? Expert consultation. I'm not always going to give any or cocaine money. Okay? So remember, this is designed for first responders in the field. Okay? So. Remember, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, getting a different response. I have had calls where kids have gotten five doses of adenosine. And this is where communication is important. If you're on the field and you're calling medical command for advice, and you tell, uh, tell us narrow complex, regular tachycardia, yeah, the safest thing, yeah, and if they're stable, go ahead and do vagal maneuvers, that doesn't work, give the adenosine. The most common misinformation that I get is they tell me it did nothing. Well, no, if it paused and then it reinitiated, that tells you something. 
tells me the mechanism. Okay, now you got to do something different. People think that adenosine is supposed to keep them out. It doesn't. Okay, and this is the other pearl. Remember, if you did, if what you did makes the patient worse, don't do it again. Okay, so here's what happened. This is the expert consultation. I was there in the ER. We confirmed the mechanism. We did a limited echo while he was in sinus, and his heart function was depressed. So babies, when they're in SVT, I always worry about because you never know if they were in it for 30 minutes or 30 hours. Because remember, when babies are in SVT, they're fine up until a point, nothing about it. The heart's a muscle like anything else. Is it feasible for them to be beating away at 300 beats per minute? No, they can probably tolerate it for a few hours. Now, the, a 40-year-old man will face plant within 30 seconds. They can't tolerate that, okay? But it's amazing what kids can tolerate. So when you're seeing a kid, and I always worry about the kid who has SVT and is vomiting. That tells me they have such low cardiac output, they're not confusing their gut. And they were probably in it for like 12 hours, okay? So this kid, because his function was depressed, I didn't even hesitate. I loaded him on IV procainamide in the ER, and then we transitioned to PO flocainide and kept him out. Okay, so I, I, antiarrhythmics will work by altering the conduction tissue of the heart. So now he won't. Now if he has PACs and PVCs, it's not going to initiate. Okay. And after one to two days, you keep him out. His function normalized. Okay. He was only in the hospital for about three days. Didn't even have to be intubated. Okay. So adenosine tips, remember, the first time a patient presents, try to get a 12 lead or a rhythm strip running when you give the adenosine. It gives us a lot of information how to manage these kids, okay? And also keeping them out. And you try to keep the infant calm as best as you can. I know it's a challenge, okay? Try to limit the motion artifacts. So, uh, you know, adenosine always has this, sense, people always say it gives you the sensation you're gonna die. Um, it vasodilates your coronary, so for an adult, you worry about if they have a fixed coronary insult, like they have a fixed plaque, and you may be causing more ischemic myocardium to become more ischemic. I don't have to worry about that in kids. The other thing that adenosine does, and this is something that I think is not imparted to people, yes, it blocks the AV node, and then it's a sympathomimetic. It actually causes release of noradrenaline at the nerve endings, and then you go into sinus tap. So that, it's that release of noradrenaline that makes people feel like they're going to die. It's only seven seconds. Okay? So what are the side effects of adenosine? So not heart block, but it causes a pause. Okay. So now remember, you guys have probably seen this in adults. If a patient is in atrial, if you're in an abnormal arrhythmia for a long period of time, it takes a while for the normal electrical pathways to wake up and reset normal rhythm. So what have you guys have you guys ever like cardioverted an adult in AFib who's been in it for like weeks to months? or at least as far as you know, been in it for a while. You guys may not have this experience because by the time you get to them, they, they get admitted to the hospital and then it's all being done in the hospital. So the patients who've been in AFib for a while, like if they've been in it for like weeks, and sometimes that happens, because you know, a lot of times adults get picked up when they see their primary doctor, they hear an irregular rhythm, and they never knew they went into it. They, you have to assume they've been in it for at least two days. When you're in, when you're in a manual rhythm for a while and then you try to convert them out, you get a long pause because it takes a while for the natural sinus node to wake up and like you said itself. Okay, so one side effect of adenosine is a pause. Okay, and yes, it scares you, but usually in a young person, their sinus node will wake up pretty quickly. Okay, but you got to be prepared, and so it's always helpful when you give adenosine. Ideally, you should have pads on because you never know if they were in it for. I've not never seen this in a young person, so maybe in a adult congenital patient or an adult, you know, when you're cardiovert, when you're going to give adenosine, have pads on because if they're asystolic and now their sinus node isn't woken up, then you got to transcutaneously pace. So just be prepared for that. I've never had to do that in a child because usually with a healthy sinus node, it wakes up pretty quickly, even if they've been in it for two days. So a long pause, there are other things also. You can, adenosine can destabilize regular rhythms and you can convert into another rhythm. I've seen SVT go into AFib. Okay, I've seen SVT also go into VT. Right? But more often than not, that doesn't happen. So, but just you gotta be prepared for that. The other thing was also this that people aren't aware of. It causes bronchospasm. So don't be, don't be like, for the teenagers that show up in SVT, you give them adenosine. Uh, haven't you, have you guys ever seen them all of a sudden start to wheeze? Or they cough? Or you're probably, everyone's focused on the rhythm, they don't realize it. If you listen to them, they're actually bronchospasm. It's a transient effect, it comes off right away. The nightmare that I have encountered once is a kid with status asthmaticus and SVT. Okay? That's a rarity. Okay? So where do these patients go? As a rule of thumb, all infants and toddlers with SVT should be admitted. Okay? Because you don't know what their heart function looks like and they can't tell you. All right? 
Um, and then ICU versus floor depends on the ED course and also the hospital. Um, you know, at Big Children's Hospital, when I was at Texas Children's, we admitted nearly to the SBT once you got him out to the regular peace floor, because uh, our cardiac floor, which had telemetry but wasn't an ICU. Here at Kentucky Children's, you know, we don't have, it's not as big as Cincinnati Children's, so most of the, all of our neonates that come in with SBT for a first-time diagnosis will go to our cardiac ICU. Doesn't mean they're getting lined or getting intubated, it's more because they have the dedicated nursing and close follow-up. Older kids and teenagers, if they're not in shock and they weren't cardioverted, you can usually discharge them from the ER as long as you call and discuss with the pediatric cardiologist. You can, the ER physician can write them a dose of beta blocker, and then as long as they can follow up established with us. Because the teenagers will know when they go into it, okay, as opposed to a toddler or a baby. So this only if you've already coordinated follow-up. Okay. IV antiarrhythmics, the ones that I'm commonly used to using, Esmolol, it's, a, it's basically IV beta blocker. It's also a short half-life, minutes. Now, not seconds like a dentine, but minutes. I, I'm always wary if it's a baby about giving Esmolol unless I'm confident that their function is okay. So the, challenge, the problem with arrhythmias in children is that if you're in it for a long period of time, the heart function starts to get depressed if you're in it for like 12 hours plus. Now, if your heart function is depressed and I give an IV beta blocker, what can happen? I can make them collapse. So think about it. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. If your stroke volume is depressed because the heart muscle is weak, and then I take away the heart rate, what, that's when you would get into trouble. Okay? Procainamide is ideal for WPW patients and AFib. Um, amiodarone ideally should only be given through a central line, but in a code situation, you can give it through a peripheral IV because it's toxic to the peripheral veins. It can be cardiodepressive in young patients, particularly those that are under age five, because kids' hearts are very calcium sensitive. Amiodarone is a calcium chelator. The instant you get into the bloodstream, it soaks up calcium, and now their SBR will drop. So often, when I do it um, in an ICU setting, obviously it's not a code situation, I'll pre-medicate with calcium gluconate before I do that amiodarone. Lidocaine is an option for frontline providers for PALS. It's actually a good medicine for VT. I would say, obviously, I think by, if you're getting to these medicines, you're already involving us. So don't do it without our backing. Okay. Now, for kids with a known history of SVT and they're coming back to the ER, you, and that's not uncommon. So what do babies do, well, do really well in the first year of life? They gain weight. Okay? So usually they're outgrowing the medicines we put them on. Okay? And if the parents aren't compliant and they're on the same dose they were on since one month of age and now they're six months of age, no kidding, they're breaking through. Okay? So if the kid presents with breakthrough SVT to the ER, usually if they're good families, they'll call us and, and they're telling us they're breaking through. We'll say, go to the ER immediately. You probably need to make sure and go up on your medicine. Find out when their last antiarrhythmic dose was, because if they're in SVT, sometimes if, if they're stable, you know, you don't have to shock them, obviously. Sometimes the easiest thing, give them an extra dose of their antiarrhythmic, wait 15 minutes, they're stable, then give the adenosine, and they'll stay out. Because remember, if you give the adenosine, they don't have enough antiarrhythmic on board, they can just go right back into it. Okay? Find out when the last time the kid ate on the off chance we have to cardiovert, and have the kid connect us to the monitors, ASAP and IV, IV access, and call us. Okay? We, we, will never, we will never yell at you guys for calling us. Alright. Questions so far? Alright. So one of your, uh, one of your co um, colleagues actually asked me a question that is worth, and I'm glad I had this prepared. So this is the one condition you never give adenosine. Okay? So just describe that rhythm. Don't give a diagnosis, just describe it. So I'm, I'll, I'll guide you. Regular or irregular? Irregular. 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 Now or why? why? That is why. So this was a teenager who was doing pull-ups on ROTC and then felt his heart suddenly start pounding out of his chest. He was awake, maintaining fine, went to the ER, that was the ECG. Okay, my, one of my partners who was on service called me, he's like, Sean, I'm getting called about a wide irregular QRS tachycardia and a kid, and I'm like, there's only two things in, that, you, that, that cause that. Um, either he's got a wide QRS at baseline and is in a weird atrial tach, or it's pre-excited atrial fibrillation. And I asked to see it, and I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> so this is the one time you never give adenosine. So now, if you go back to, sorry. So the way to think about um, WPW and pathways is this, and this is actually an important concept, and this is the reason why I think people get in trouble and don't understand it. And this is what I how I teach uh, parents in clinic when I when I tell them what WPW is. WPW is the name after three cardiologists who discovered that if you have this pattern on your ECG, P, short PR, delta wave, wide QRS, 
Okay. About the way of why QR is short PR interval, that leads to SVT, like reentry SVT that we saw in that baby. Okay? So what I tell them is this: imagine your heart like a nightclub. Okay? Heart is the right side, has the left side, and the pacemaker, the natural looks at the sinus node, and you got your AV node, his Purkinje system, and this is your okay, your AV node, imagine like a bouncer in front of the nightclub. There's a concert going on, you got a giant line extending all the way out. His job is to make sure there's steady flow into the nightclub. You know, if it's New York, they're making sure you go amount of guys and girls um, and regulating the traffic in and out. Now you have an accessory pathway. Now imagine you got this jackass at the back door of the nightclub who's letting people rush the stage. What happens? It gets chaotic. All right? So what can happen with SBT is if it degenerates into AFib, now you have multiple atrial foci firing at once. Your atria are going to raise at 400 beats per minute. What, is the, what does your AV node do to protect you? And actually, before that, let me ask one question. For all the adults you've seen in AFib, how come they don't drop dead when they go into AFib? Your AV node protects you. Okay. Your AV node is what's called decremental conduction. It means that if your atria are beating at 400 beats per minute, only like 150 of the beats are getting to the ventricles. Okay? So it's protecting your ventricles. Accessory pathways in WPW don't decrement. So now 400 beats per minute, your AV node is trying to protect it, but now you have this jackass in the back door of the nightclub, 400 beats gets right down to the ventricles and go into the VF. So why irregular? Never get a denosine. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Amiodarone has some amino blocking yeah. properties, so do you avoid amiodarone too? I avoid amio because of the logistics, because it's safer to get through a central line and it's cardiodepressant. Okay. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do out in the field. Okay, and that's that's a hard decision to make, and I'll actually explain a case where I had to use it once. Okay. So does that make sense? So. The best advice I give to people like on the front lines is if you don't know what the rhythm is, just describe what you see to medical command or the physician and let them make the, help them guide you. Because this is a patient, if you thought, oh, it's a young kid, it has to be SVT, you gave adenosine, you would have killed him. Okay, I told the ER, like once I saw his pre-excited AFib, give him some Versid and cardiovert him, just get him out. I took him to the, I did not let him leave the hospital because that tells me this accessory pathway is high risk, the fact that he went to AF. Okay, took him to the lab the next day and it found his accessory pathway, got rid of it. Okay. <laughs> so we're really not talking down to people like when we say, just tell us what you see because you know, for all you know, it, you could be wrong. Okay, and it's better to have the right information moving forward. Okay. This was also like welcome to attending hood, year two. This was like during the Christmas holidays. Six month old infant with now he has a, anatomically has a normal heart, but he's got something abnormal. He's got a condition called tuberosclerosis, which is very rare. You get cardiac tumors in the heart, okay? In the ventricles, the rhabdomyomas. He was born a term and they made the diagnosis and confirmed it. They actually found it as a fetus when he was scanned by the OB, like on his heart. And they confirmed it after he was born and he was doing fine. Um, so just following up pediatric cardiology, most rhabdomyomas resolve on their own. You just follow up pediatric cardiology, get surveillance echoes. He had a lot. Um, and then he was fine after birth, normal function. The only time you worry if the tumors are obstructing inflow into the heart or out, getting out of the heart. He had some lesions in his head that also go with tuberous sclerosis and he was evaluated at the Cincinnati Tuberous Sclerosis Clinic and he lives out near Ephraim McDowell. So this is Ephraim McDowell calling me. He had a follow-up with us here, one to three months of age, no progression of the tumors, function stable, and he's gaining weight and doing fine. So no, no reason to treat or do anything. You're not going to cut these out because there's no way you can. Okay, so all that hyper bright stuff um, are tumors in his ventricular septum and on his LV free wall. Here was his ECG at, two, at three months of age. It actually looks like a normal ECG for a baby. Okay. He's got that normal T-wave inversion, you see on the right side of the lead, normal QRS progression. And now he's six months old. He wakes up late afternoon from a nap and he's screaming and upset. Very atypical, he was fed two hours prior. He went limp in mom's arms within a minute and woke up crying. 911 was called, you must put him on the monitor. He was crying with a heart rate of 250. He was brought to the outside EC ER. Here was his ECG. Okay, describe it. Why? Regular. 
This is not your mother's version of SVT. Okay? So you guys did much better than the machine. If you look at the machine read, it says SVT. Okay? Adult ECG machines, it's looking at the QRS and thinking it's narrow for an adult. This is wide for a baby. This is 100 milliseconds. So you're right, 100 milliseconds is normal for an adult. ER doctor called me and they thought it was SVT and I said, no it isn't. <laughs> Again, that's when I had that giant pit in the feeling of my stomach and started to get nauseous. Okay, ER physician called me, I was the one on call. So my initials, Sean Mohan, I jokingly said for my first year here was shit magnet. Because I would always get these complex ones when I was on call. So they gave adenosine twice with no change. No kidding, it's VT, it's not gonna do anything. All right, they was difficult to be getting IV access, they got IO in him and it flushes. Child's alert, BP cup is difficulty measuring his blood pressure, no kidding, with a heart rate of 250. I reviewed the strips. I assumed this, this was presumptively unstable VT and it looks like VT looking at the ECG. Because if you look at this, it's not a normal QRS progression. But he's positive in V1, he's negative in V6, he's negative in 1. That's not a normal QRS shape for, for anyone, independent of the tumors. Okay, here's the ECG here when he got here to the ICU. Okay. So clinical. So I actually told them, all right, start IV Esmolol, try to slow down his rate. I heard him screaming in the background. So that tells me that he has enough cardiac output, he's perfusing his brain. Okay, I was worried about the fact that he still uh, passed out at home. Okay. So my concern with giving amio to a child is for kids who are very calcium dependent, I can make him worse, and he's in a hospital where there's no mechanical support or surgical backup. Now, this is the hard decision for children. Like, you have to ask yourself, what are your resources? You know, because you have to think two steps ahead. So, for you guys out in the field, if you weren't even at the ER, it would actually, and if he was passing out in front of you, it is actually within clinical reason you shocking this kid. Okay, no one would fault you otherwise. Okay? You know, I had the benefit, I was the one on the phone, and I could hear him screaming in the background. And I was telling the ER doc, okay, get an IV in him, start IV Asmolol, we're gonna have a helicopter come and get the kid over here. Because at least I knew here I had Dr. Quintessenza, a pediatric CT surgeon, because my concern was is that he would need ECMO. Okay? So, the yeah, this is the dilemma I had. Shock or not shock, low with antiarrhythmic, transferred to Cincinnati, which is further than Kentucky Children's. And what's my bailout plan? Now he got here, and he's on IVS Mall. They're getting him lined up and getting ready to intubate, and look what happens. So what happens in the second half of the strip? What's the rhythm? It's VF. I'm right there at the bedside, and I'm like, oh crap. And I, I start chest compressions right there on him. Okay? His VT degenerated. So for any abnormal rhythm, the heart, you know, it, everything becomes chaotic and it degenerates. SVTs can degenerate into AF. They often don't degenerate into VT, VF, but VT can go into VF. It makes sense. Okay? You can tell I'm doing chest compressions because look at the undulation. And then we shocked him, we defibrillated him, got him out, and. After conversion, he gets intubated, and he goes right back into VT again. Okay? Um, I had already called our PED CT surgeon at that point, okay? And we put him on ECMO in the unit. With the heart decompressed, uh, we finally, one, as soon as cannulas were in and we defibrillated him, he stayed out. I think once you took away the catecholamines and the adrenaline, he was sedated and offloading his heart, he actually stayed out. We loaded him with IV amiodarone for two days and arranged transfer to Cincinnati Children's, and this was how the story panned out. He got weaned off ECMO um, with lidocaine, and then he pretty much declared himself he needs an ICD. You can't cut out these tumors. The tumors are the source of the VT. So he came off ECMO, and then they tried to do it without him having to go back on more antiarrhythmic, and they couldn't. I added flecainide, um, and we continued the amio. And he ended up getting an ICD, which at this age only a surgeon can place because we don't have ICD leads that are small enough for a child's veins. Okay? He was discharged three weeks later, and amazingly, he did great. His brain is fine. So that tells you, you know, if you promptly recognize things, CPR right away. So I did CPR before shocking. Okay, remember, that is the, you guys learned that in ACL, that's the same thing with PALS. Okay? He follows up with the Cincinnati Tubular Sclerosis Clinic, and I get updates from the Cincinnati team up there, uh, only because they have a tubular sclerosis clinic, so you can see neurology as well as you know cardiology all together at once. Here we don't have that type of infrastructure and that manpower. So more importantly, we had to so we had to win. Okay. Um, 
this is this i'm going to go through really quickly 14 year old kid with an irregular heart rate who um, i saw as an outpatient because he had idiopathic vt so he's in sinus rhythm and he's having these random pcs and having a of vt he's fine it was just found by accident like when the pcp was auscultating he's like yeah this is a regular rhythm got an ecg here we are so he saw he already done a halter as an outpatient and he was having runs of non-sustained vt and he's fine he's like this tall a baseball player um, his echo had a normal anatomy. We did a stress test and his PVCs went away, which is a good sign. So usually most channelopathy disorders, if this was something congenital like a gene mutation that was adrenaline sensitive, usually VT gets worse when you exercise them. The fact that the VT goes away and it's just sinus tack, that's a good sign. That means I know he's safe if he does sports. Okay? The adults see this too. This is idiopathic right ventricular alpha tract VT, which the adults see and I see. So we don't always jump to ablating. You know, we only treat if they're having depressed function from all the VT or if they're symptomatic from it. He didn't feel it. Um, and I probably didn't have to treat him, but you know, I was trying to make his VT better. Um, so I started him on a beta blocker and I lifted his activity restrictions because he had a good stress test. You know, Natalol, I'm not gonna go through all the pharmacology. You guys know how it works. It's a beta blockade. It, you know, it suppresses your adrenaline tone. His father then called me three weeks later because he was concerned for signs of clinical depression. Not all was discontinued um, because beta blockers can do that. You know, you guys see adults who go on a beta blocker and they get very depressed, they're sleepy. Uh, and then I started verapamil, which is also a good medicine for this type of VT. Um, it works by inhibiting calcium channels. It's a weak vasodilator. Dad got a call at 11 p.m. from one of his son's friends. He was chatting online. His son apparently, his girlfriend broke up with him and then he ingested the whole bottle. 911 was called, there's your rhythm. Guesses? Those are all the P waves. Okay. So rapamil ingestion can do this. All right. Even beta block overdose can do this. The difference between the two is what? What's your glucose? Okay. So he was hyperglycemia uh, because of the verapamil effect, um, and that's how you can distinguish it from beta blocker toxicity. You maintain their circulation. If their mental status is down, you have to intubate in the field. Okay? So altered mental status, complete heart block and cardiogenic shock. Um, this is how you would treat, and this is where you're going to be with medical command and even poison control. Okay? And he actually did better. So you, if you support them, he was intubated, put on IV glucagon, and you get something about it. if you're having a calcium channel overdose, how do you treat that? You get calcium. Okay? And he got better. You had to wait for the rapid milk to get metabolized. He's doing fine now, thankfully. And you know, with good mental health care, he's been seeing a mental uh, counselor. He's no longer on an SSR, SSRI anymore. Um, he's going to go to college next year. Okay? Um, I think I covered all the major points. Um, I want to make sure there were some notes I took for myself. I want to make sure I covered with you guys. Making sure noting the dosage for shocking patients. So remember, when you're cardioverting someone, you have to synchronize. Okay, that means synchronize means that the machine is going to recognize the QRS complex. If you don't synchronize, what's the risk you take? You can create an R on T. You shock on a T wave when the heart is repolarizing, and you can go into VF. So you can take an unstable, a you know relatively stable rhythm, and make it more unstable. Okay. Defibrillation is the gold standard for VF. Okay? There are some VTs that you can cardiovert. Okay? And so SVT, you should always cardiovert. The mistake that also I've seen is that when people cardiovert, and then remember, it may not keep them out. If they have a reentry circuit and their adrenaline is high enough, they may go right back into it. The mistake that people make is they don't resync. So remember, after you've discharged your defibrillator, your car you cardioverted, the machine, you're, you're no longer synced. So you have to remember to resync. Okay? And then I think I covered a lot of things. So there's a lot more of that things that I see, but I figured uh, I didn't want to take up too much of your guys' time. Questions? Okay, I hope this was helpful. Thank you.